innovation, but I'm still interested. If Bear with me, you don't agree, but bear with me. If we can assume that people go in there thinking there's a difference that needs to be made, how is it that politicians, generation after generation, fall into the trap of defining the hardest issues that we face in the black and white terms? It's called elections. And, and, and like, even in my era, without social media, um, loads of people from issue to issue are very lazy or they want to retain the comfort they have and they do not want that comfort, whether it's around property rights, whether it's around facing themselves and their abusive characteristics in the mirror, um, whether it's about sharing central government resources with more people, um, whether it's about planning for the future as opposed to operating for tomorrow. Because tomorrow is the electoral approach and the future is I'm here for the good of the country. Actually, one of the... I'll come to you in a minute, Margaret, but Marilyn, lastly on this point with you, one of the amazing things about your book is that you detail... Um, conversations that happened in caucus and, in, and and we'll come to the ethics of that in a moment but <laughs> the um, but over and over again in those recorded conversations from caucus you're talking about big crunchy difficult issues and over and over again MPs are saying words to the effect of this is going to hurt me in my electorate and I won't I won't win back my seat Um, th that's how it how it rocks, and and in the so for example, um, I was in a caucus leading up to uh, election seventy eight, election eighty one, election eighty four. I often wasn't in caucus because by then, uh, and besides, it was going to be earlier, right? Um, I didn't know that at the time, but nonetheless. And what I found was in each electoral year, the provincial margin, the, the members of parliament who held the provincial marginals had the biggest voice in caucus. They'd just get up and rant about how if we didn't do A, B or C, they'd lose. Um, now, the, 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 I, I'd be very interested to watch the provincial marginals in the Labour Party as we proceed toward the next election. And what's so extraordinary, because this is a... Uh, MMP versus uh, FPP, first past the post, the provincial marginals are exactly the same electorates as they've always been. The 70s, the 80s, the 90s, it doesn't matter how you, withdrew, you, you redrew them or anything else, they're exactly the same seats, mm. still holding the country at bay, as it were. Well, in the Labour Party caucus at the moment, there'd be a whole bunch of people who knew from the day they were elected they were never going to be re-elected because they're never going to get that list vote again. Margaret, let's bring you into it. I mean, you worked in a, in a different time. Yes, it was under First Past the Post, as was Marilyn's. Um, but you also worked for a, different, a very um, different Prime Minister. The, the Norm Kirk you describe, um, it was a bit like Muldoon in the sense that you describe someone who was a loner, he was a bit aloof from his colleagues. He was a man very much who relied on his own instincts. Is that a fair... Have I, have I read that correctly? Yes, I think so. Um, I would say that. Uh, but I did... I have to say this. This sounds terribly political. But then among both sides of the House, it was far more collegial, I thought. Um, it wasn't really until Robert Muldoon came along that it started to get really, um, I was going to say, a bit vindictive. But you all remember the Moyle affair and various other things that happened. And normally, um, families were never mentioned in Parliament. There was a whole lot of, that changed during that time. So it was much more collegial. Also, most, because it was men, older men, uh, when I was called, still white men, uh, four, four Maori, because it was four Maori, um, seats. Um, most of the men um, wanted to hold on to their seats because they saw it as a lifetime. Um, and when I still want to call him Mr. Kirk, I can't get over that. That's shocking at my age. Norman Kirk, 
uh, when he went in, I think most of his front row was 70. Uh, I think one was just on 80. So he bought in a rule uh, through caucus, of course, um, saying that when you were 70, you had to resign from the Labour um, caucus. Uh, so then it wasn't like now where people just leave and go on to another career. They just held on. There's a um, mythology around Kirk, right? I mean, I don't think that... It's hard to imagine, and maybe that's because politics have changed, um, but it's hard to imagine any leader having a, a sort of mythological legacy in the way that Kirk has. What, what was... How was that... A sta you know, how did that begin? Well, he himself, um, I thought that he would be so shocked if he'd been at his own funeral because he really thought that no one particularly liked him. He had no idea that he was as popular as he was. Um, how did the myth start? Uh, I think really because in the sort of 18 to 20 months he was alive, he did take some big steps. You can think immediately of anti-nuclear. You can think of the Springbok tour counselling that. Um, but there was lots of other things, um, believe it or not, like improving the status of women. Um, and a num really, that was what he was trying to do. Now, there was big problems, particularly if you remember with the oil shocks, all sorts of things happened. But I think it was because these things were done, they were done in a short time, and they were done very clearly. It was clearly put to the people what was happening. And I think people wanted that after years of Hollyoke, which was sort of steady as she goes. So initially, well, the original plan was you were going to write this book with him. That's right. When he retired sometime in the future. And so you were keeping, you were clearly keeping the diary, because that's what it is. Yes. And he was giving you information for the diary. Yes, yes. Well, there was letters that would come through and he'd say, well, mm, I think you better keep a copy of that. So that was good. And I was making my own notes. Um, a lot of them were my own notes, not his. But if there was anything um, particularly important, he might say, come into the office. Um, if there was a press, and a really interesting um, gathering of the press and he had something important to say, he'd come say, come and sit and listen to this. So I really felt quite privileged over that. And Marilyn, you were clearly keeping a diary. Or, I mean, you, you left Parliament with hundreds and hundreds of pages of documentation. <laughs> Look at that face, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> Between your grin and your eyebrow raise, I feel, you know, I feel like they've got the blandest face in the country at the moment. But go on, off you go. <laughs> okay. Well, look, you know, if you read the book, you'll find it was really an accident that I got there because it was International Women's Year and, you know, I joined the Women's Electoral Lobby and, and uh, they'd written to all of the... Uh, executive directors of the parties, asking them why they didn't select more women. And, and it was almost like the, the boys had gathered at the Gestetna and shared the letter, um, you know, because they all said, um, well, of course, we'd love more women if only they'd offer themselves. Mm. Mm. So the women's electoral lobby, remember there was Margaret Shields, Fran Wild, uh, Sonia, a whole group, um, Marika Robinson. So a number of us just thought, oh, all right, for the hell of it, we'll prove that wrong, right? We'll put ourselves forward. And truly, 22-year-old in the third safest national rural constituency in the entire country, how was that ever going to happen? I thought I was quite safe, really. <laughs> um, but anyway, mm, it did. Um, but I... It, and then I never thought I'd last. And a man called Jim Trowey rang up and made an appointment to see me and he came in and he introduced himself as the current chief librarian at the Alexander Turnbull Library. And he said, well, we don't collect many politicians' papers, but we've had a discussion and we think yours might be going to be interesting. <laughs> so could you sign this piece of paper? And at the end of every year, we'll just come and clean out the files you tell us to clean out. And off they trickled over to be put in cold storage. It really is cool down there. Um, in the at Turnbull Library. So they were all being secured. 
And then I wrote notes all the time. I, I, I can remember Brian Tallboy's even saying to me, are you writing down what's going on in caucus? And I was as close, I used to sit directly in front of Muldoon in caucus so he could never look straight ahead. And I would always laugh that his legs never hit the ground. And when he got excited, they used to move, you know. And I'd start going like this too, you see. So, look, I truly, there were loads, of, but I, and I said to Brian Tallboys, no, no, I'm just making notes, but that's not true. I was taking down nearly every word. Even though the rules were you weren't to take notes. Yeah, yeah, but well, there were only, there was just, there were only there was, rules. No, but they weren't written rules anywhere. <laughs> they were just, you know, we didn't do that. And besides, if you've been in a National Party caucus, the rule is that you are always entitled to go to the Turnbull and access the, the minutes. But Hugh Templeton was the minute keeper and he was lazy and he'd get distracted and he'd talk and he wouldn't write things down. So I had a better record than anybody. So that's, <laughs> you know, that's, that's what I did. And I thought to myself, oh, and the other thing that was really important was whenever I travelled, whenever I travelled, every three days I would write back to my constituency and it would be circulated through every office holder and I would write exactly what I'd been doing and what it was about, and I'd forgotten I'd done that. And then I found them in the archives when I was writing the book, and they became a really substantial part of the book. Um, so, it, it, thanks to Jim Trowey, really, mm. and that wander across the road and having me sign, they would take everything. So, so much of it was already taken care of. It's just that I then had to go through two to three hundred boxes to write the book. Quite a distillation. Judith, do you keep a diary? Uh, I keep diaries. Sorry, I keep diaries at various times. So, um, you mean when the shit hits the fan? No, actually, even before that. Um, <laughs> and it always does. Because <laughs> if you go into politics and think that you're there just to make up the numbers, then you shouldn't go into politics in my opinion. Um, so I've kept diaries over the years, but also I keep records, I keep um, all sorts of information, and I'm a lawyer, so you know, any lawyer who doesn't keep records is not going to stay long. And so do you ever take notes in caucus? Uh, no, I never have to. I've never had to say what's happened in caucus, and if I take notes, it's to like things like go and do X or something, I'm supposed to do something. Yep. So I don't, I don't, and... I'm very careful not to, but the great thing is there's obviously so much connection between some people who obviously media seem to have all sorts of information out of caucus things, and I always keep all the media reports on anything, basically, and so I can go back and say what's happened on certain days because there'll be a media report about it. So, um, and it ain't me that's do who does it. Do you know who it is? No, I think it's various people over the years have done things. I, I remember, well, in my book I spoke about, um, you might all remember there was once an MP called Brian Connell. You don't remember, do you? No. And there we go. Um, but he obviously was accused at one stage of leaking out a caucus um, about something that happened with uh, Dr Don Brash. And, you know, those sorts of things. Um, he's no longer an MP. He wasn't straight after that. So it's like we just don't. Don't ever. I never do. And since I'm often someone who's stood up against whatever I'm being told I have to do, I'm always very careful to be very, you know, about those sorts of things. I can actually say that some of the worst leakers in the National Party caucus went on to become very senior cabinet ministers. Yes, I 